All right, so on more Java-related topics. Uh, <laughs> um, questions on, I, I guess I'm talking about chapter four today. Uh, so questions on loops. Yes, Joe. Uh, not necessarily on loops, but is there a, like a uh, Java loop that you can do it within Java? Um, so, everything that's mentioned in here about um, debugging is things you can do in Java. Um, there are certainly ways that, um, that you can use Java editors and things called IDEs, Integrated Development Environments, uh, like, like we used in Visual Basic, um, to set breakpoints and set real watches and use an immediate window and do sort of all sorts of cool things like that. Dr. Java doesn't provide any of that, or at least I haven't found any of that. It would be really cool if it had breakpoints, but I don't think it does. But it seems like you can write most of that into your program. Like Yes. Like so when they, they talk about watching, um, somewhere in here, I just saw it, um, watching variables, and it's basically a system.out.println statement. Um, it's kind of the poor man's way of debugging. Um, and this really, before IDEs really existed uh, in languages like C, that's how you would do debugging. Um, print out, hey, I got here before I segfaulted. Or, hey, I got here before, in Java, no pointer exception. Um, this is the value of the variable at this point. Call a method. This is the value of the variable afterward. Um, I'd say IDEs make that stuff a little bit easier. Um, introduces a bunch of overhead and the requirement that you have the IDE next to you when you're running your program, which in some cases is not possible. Um, the instance that comes to mind is something like mobile programming. The IDEs are pretty good about being able to connect to a phone and debug like that. But sometimes, uh, for instance, if you're debugging GPS stuff, it's very hard to debug GPS stuff when your phone's connected to the computer and you're sitting program cr programming in a basement. Um, so GPS will fail every time. This is what we were running into in the lab. Every time we tried to get a GPS location, it would fail because that's the basement of this building, and this building is not the best construction for getting a GPS signal. As soon as we take the phone outside, we can't have it attached to a computer anymore. It would be really inconvenient. Um, so in that case, we're pretty much limited to uh, things like the, the equivalent of a system.out.println statement, um, specific logging, that sorts of things. Um, and since Dr. Java doesn't have any of those cool features, breakpoints, watches, immediate window, we're limited to just what the language provides. Um, and the language does actually provide an assert statement, uh, which, which basically says, evaluate this expression. If this expression is true, continue executing. If this expression is false, break horribly uh, with an optional mes message and don't do anything else. There's no way to catch it. So the rule with assertions is that if you give your, as soon as you give a compiled version of your code to someone else, it should not have assertions in it because they don't expect your program to break just to check things that should already be the case. Um, assert statements are good for checking things like preconditions. Like this method specifically expects an integer to be greater than three. And then you can assert this integer greater than three. You have to write uh, an absurd statement for every set at that point then? If you're... So assertions and testing should not be confused. Okay. Um, assertions are for things basically to check that a situation that should never, ever, ever be the case is actually not the case. Uh, testing. Um, which 
there, there are testing frameworks. Um, the most common one is, is JUnit. It's a unit testing framework, so you can test your program method by method. This is getting way out of scope, but if you're doing unit testing, they, there are methods that are called things like assert. Uh, and the point of those is to make sure that you feed something into your method, it returns what you're expecting. And that's specifically a testing framework, and that's a completely separate code base from your actual program that you're intending to ship. Um, so that program shouldn't have assert statements. Uh, definitely shouldn't have assert statements that should ever, ever, ever actually uncover a situation where the thing they're asserting is false. You know that means that you're wrong? You're written that, means, wrong? that means that you haven't properly error checked, you haven't um, handled the situations where, for instance, the user gives you bad data. Um, and for this class, for the sake of time, we don't have to worry about the user giving you bad data. The user is me. I'm not going to give your programs bad data. Uh, except for one assignment when I was specifically intend to give your programs bad data because that's the point of the assignment. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the case. I don't remember exactly. Um, if we talk about exceptions, that will be the case. If we don't talk about exceptions, don't worry about it. Um, but when you, when you go out into the, you know, the real world, a less controlled environment, and actually write programs for other people to use who don't already know what your program is supposed to do, they are, nine times out of ten, they're going to give your program bad data at least on the first run. If not, three months down the road when they forget how to use your program. Um, in both cases, you'll want to give them some error message like user error. You typed a string where an int was expected. So. Does control seem Does control, uh, I... Or what... Let's see. I did get an infinite loop a couple of days ago, and I don't remember what I had to do. Control C was the one where it stopped the program in mid-loop. Yes. It, control C <laughs> might work, because I don't see a, uh, a stop running button in Dr. Java. Um, so I might have ended it with Control C. Uh, I think it was the other class where I ran into this. Um, control C is something that comes from Unix. It's the, the term signal. Uh, the, hey, program, you should stop now. Um, and in general, that stops your program and it's tracked. It's nice about it because the program can actually handle that and um, do something, for instance, close all files it's using, stop communicating on the network, nice things like that. Um, there's also a version of that sig kill, which is doesn't have a key combination, um, which is lower level than the program. It tells the operating system, this program needs to die now. The operating system takes the program out of memory, it deallocates all the program's memory, and just doesn't let, it, it no longer continues to execute the program. So the program had absolutely no control over it. Um, but control C will definitely work at the command line if you run Java programs from the command line. Um, even at the Windows command line, even though it's not Unix. Um, I don't know if it will work in Dr. Java. I suppose we can very quickly find, where's my mouse? We can very quickly find out. There it is. Um, and this will give a good example of the simplest loop you could possibly write. I'm having trouble managing my windows here. There we go. Okay. So, mm, Public class loops public static void main string args
Okay, simplest loop you could possibly write. This is an infinite loop that does absolutely nothing. Uh, let's make it a little more exciting. Um, this is one case where white space or lack thereof doesn't make any bit of difference. Um, most of the time, the, the, in general, the rule that applies is if there's a clear distinction between uh, text and a symbol, the white space is optional. But if, if the meaning would be different if you took the white space out, then you need the white space. So that's equally valid. However, if I take out this space, that's not. And Dr. Java shows me by turning it black instead of blue. So we'll put the space back. I use spaces because it's a little. I find it a little bit easier to read. Um, so let's switch back to the other class. Control C does not work. Okay, let's let's find out what it does. All right, so I'm running an infinite loop, and that will never stop. And it's giving me Java's version of the spinning pinwheel of death. <laughs> and if you could see my I have a little thing in my menu bar that shows CPU usage, and it is 100%. Well, actually, technically 200%, because this has two cores. One of them is running the video. The other one is being eaten up by Java. Um, if I don't watch out, it could actually crash the video. That has happened before. Um, so how do we stop this? Reset works. Yes, OK. That that makes sense. So if you get into an infinite loop situation, use the reset button. Um, All right, so let's let's make this um, do something a little bit more useful. A little bit less irritating. Uh, Let's make a loop that goes from 0 to 10 and uh, we'll change this. We'll print out the value of i on every iteration. So what's the first number that this will print out? Correct. And the last number that this will print out? No. Nine. Yes. So the people who have done Visual Basic before and Python is the same as this. Um, this is not like the Visual Basic loop where it's I give it the starting value and the ending value inclusive and it goes all the way through. Um, because I have this uh, while i is less than 10. So the last time that i is less than 10 is when i equals 9. As soon as it equals 10, that is false. It won't execute the loop body anymore. Yes, question. Can you put the i plus plus on the same line and just the next line, or is it just better than Like this? And if, if I take this line out, is that what you're asking? Yes. Well, no, you have print i, and then you have the i plus plus, so it continues coming up. But then you have the i plus plus after the system output now? Oh, yeah. You can have as many statements as you want on the same line. It, um, you don't actually. So what you're saying is something like this. Uh, if I get the yeah something like that. Yeah. There's no difference. This is a case where um, white space really doesn't matter, or the the white space that you have really doesn't matter. 
In fact, you could have no weight space at all because the semicolon and the I are different enough that Java can distinguish. The semicolon ends the statement, and the I is an identifier that starts the next one. Yes, Joe. You're jumping ahead of me. Yes, you can. And so let's let's start by compiling and running this. And it counts from zero to nine. Let's say that we want this to uh, go from one to ten and print out one one to ten. We have a couple different options. We have at least three that I can think of. We can have we can start i at 1 and say i is less than or equal to 10 and that would print 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, another option is keep the loop the way it is because this is a known state. We know what this is going to do. But we want to print out for each, each time we print something out we want to print one greater than what i actually is. So we can just do i plus 1 and that'll accomplish it as well. Um, however, we can notice that we're incrementing, we're storing in a temporary value i plus 1, so we can print it out, and then we compute i plus 1 and store it back in i on the next line. That's kind of redundant. Um, so what we can actually do is, instead of using the, the postfix version of the increment operator, we can use the prefix version of the increment operator to increment the value of i immediately before it's evaluated, which means immediately before it gets printed. And then we can remove this statement. And then run, and we get 1 through 10. Questions? So the um, it the difference between the, the postfix version of the increment operator and the prefix version of the increment operator, um, and it's the same for the decrement operator for two minus signs, um, is that is when the increment occurs relative to when the variable is evaluated. So it's basically a matter of, do I increment the value, the variable first, and then give the, the value that's in the value variable, or do I give the value that's in the variable first, and then increment it? So in this case, um, in this case, I is sent to println first, and then it's incremented. Uh, in the other case, it's incremented, and then Java asks, what is the value of I? Which at that point, it is one more than it was at the beginning of the loop. So in this case, because it's a simple case, this, this formulation is exactly the same as if we'd done that, or to be completely unambiguous, I'll say doing that. Whereas if it's postfix notation, it's equivalent to if we'd done this statement after we print it out. There is a, this is nuanced, so it's not specific to this gets evaluated before the entire statement happens or after the entire statement happens. It is the increment or decrement happens before or after that variable is evaluated. So if you have a decrement, if you have the variable used multiple times in a statement and one of them has an increment or decrement um, before or after it, it's possible that that variable could be evaluated to two different values in the same statement. That can be really irritating and really confusing, and uh, don't do it. 
I've never run into a case where that is actually useful. I have come up with contrived examples as to where when that is not useful, but don't do it. Separate your increment and decrement from your everything else, the rest of your logic. Um, so if we go back to what we had before, um, which again this this prints out uh, sure. This prints out the numbers 0 through 9. Um, this is a very common format for loops. Um, frequently, we have a set of numbers that we want to run through, and we want to do something based on each of those numbers. Um, we haven't talked about arrays yet, but arrays are an excellent example of when a... Um, a loop that iterates over a set of numbers is, is useful um, because those numbers are used to index a position inside this array. Um, right now this is kind of a con contrived example because we're just printing out the number. Um, but it still demonstrates the, the importance of this, this formulation. There are three important parts of this loop. Well, technically four, but three that really matter here. Um, the first part is this initialization step where we set i to zero or some initial value. It doesn't have to be zero. Uh, is that the same when you're making the boolean true at the beginning? That's the initialization state? Sure. Yeah. Um, basically, the, it's, it's the starting state. Whatever you want the state to be before you enter the loop. You also have some condition um, that describes the conditions under which the loop should continue to do its looping. As soon as that condition is false, the loop no longer executes and jumps to the, the first statement immediately after the loop. Right now we don't have anything, but it's basically line 9. Then there's an approach. We need, unless we really want an infinite loop, we need some way of getting from the initialization state to a state that will make the condition false, uh, which will terminate the loop, break us out of the loop, and continue executing our program. Uh, this is usually called the approach. Uh, and here, it's an increment of i. Uh, I have seen instances where the number 2 is added to the i, uh, so every other number. Uh, you can do every third number. It could be even something that's totally unrelated to numbers. The important part is that there are those three pieces. The uh, initialization, which could be as simple as setting something to true. Um, your uh, condition, which could be as simple as checking to see if that thing is true. Um, and then your approach. At some point, under some condition in your loop, you change that Boolean variable to false. And now that'll make the condition fail. Um, there's a lot of flexibility. Integers, Booleans. Um, doubles and floats don't work as well because they are not stored uh, exactly in memory. It's kind of an approximation. Uh, if you get a lot of decimal places, it's definitely an approximation. Uh, and in those cases, equality operations, uh, inequality operations, they don't work so well. Two numbers that print out with the same exact value that are stored in doubles, it's entirely possible that they are not actually equal to each other. And one is ever so slightly less than or greater than the other one. Um, so the book specifically mentions don't use equals or not equals with floats and doubles. Uh, less than less than comparisons, greater than comparisons. Uh, they work okay as long as the numbers don't get too close. Or if you're testing until a one number exceeds another number. What do you mean by getting too close? Um, if they, if you end up with two numbers that, uh, when you visualize them, when you print them out, presentations are just different enough. Uh, because equals and non-equals 
basically just compare the bytes or the bits. So if the bits are exactly the same, um, that works. Uh, with integers, the representation for a number is the only representation for that number. With floats and doubles, that's not true. Uh, and then the fourth part of this formulation of a while loop is what's considered the loop body. Um, so things that you do inside the loop. The actual computation that the loop does. Um, so I'm going to copy and paste this code. And write it slightly differently. Because this formulation of a while loop is so common, there's actually another kind of loop that takes advantage of that, that fact, uh, called the for loop. Um, and the basic idea behind a for loop is that it's for some value going to some other value, do something. Uh, and we can pretty much take most of what we've written and just move it around a little bit. So I'm going to type four at the beginning there and open a parenthesis. Um, and then this initialization step stays exactly as it is, followed by the semicolon. Next comes our condition, which is in there pretty much verbatim. Follow that by a semicolon. And now we actually have to do some cutting and pasting. So cut that approach, paste it in at the end, close the... Um, the parentheses, we don't need that semicolon, but we have now changed that for loop into a while loop. I haven't actually written any additional syntax. I just moved around some of the things that I already have. Um, and that does exactly the same thing as the while loop. Uh, what did I do? I is already defined. Okay, fine. We'll change that to J. I do not need a semicolon at the end. No. So in this case, the semicolons are... Um, right. Should change it everywhere. The semicolons are dividers not uh, terminators, which is good because then they'd start looking for Saracana. And the, like I mentioned, the for loop does exactly the same thing, prints out the number 0 through 9. Questions on that? Does the J++, is that assumed to always be the last thing? Yes. So the um, the. I mean, that's now just putting it underneath. In both, so right now the answer is yes. In a minute, I'm going to show you when the answer would be no. Um, but, and the longer answer, the longer version of the answer yes is that when these statements, which are kind of complicated <coughs> statements, are compiled into the lower level Java bytecode, both of those things, aside from the variable name difference, compile into essentially the same set of instructions. Um, so Java takes this initialization step and executes it first, then it creates this test, basically like line 5, um, then, it, then it compiles the loop body and the last thing that it does is that, that increment step. Correct. It's a line by itself. It's I know I know people who just on general principle always do plus plus J there. Most of the world does J plus um, plus. So the only instance when that is not the case is 
the book mentions uh, continue and break, and then immediately says, don't ever use these. Um, I'm going to relax that a little bit. It's okay to use continue and break until you find out why you're using continue and break. So it's good, they're good intermediate steps. Uh, usually, uh, with break especially, you can think of loops as kind of like a wheel. And you enter at one point in the wheel, and usually that should be your exit point in the wheel as well. When you're using a break statement, you're picking somewhere else along the wheel, and that's where you're jumping out. Um, once you write the loop, it might be easier to visualize how your loop is supposed to operate if you do that. But once you have the entire loop written, it's a good idea to figure out why you're breaking somewhere in the middle and figure out how you can maneuver that to your condition at the top. Um, and it might involve using a do-while loop, which I haven't actually mentioned yet. Um, it might involve changing the order of that things happen in your loop. Um, and there's really no method. There's no, no technique for doing that. Uh, I think it kind of comes from experience. And once you figure out what your loop is supposed to be doing, then you can kind of reason out how you can reform, reformat your loop so that it, it does what it's supposed to. Um, so let's um, actually. Yeah, let's do that. So, don't run that. One of these will result in an infinite loop, the other one will not. And the reason for that is that with the while formulation, writing continue here, um, the book describes that continue tells the loop to immediately start the next iteration of the loop. Or basically start running the loop again, uh, ignoring any statement that's below the continue statement inside the loop. So in the while loop, this I++ plus plus is a statement inside the loop. It is part of the loop body. So the continue statement will jump over that and continue ex executing the loop. Um, we now have, because there's no condition on this, we now have no, we, we have no approach. Uh, even if we did have a condition on this, it would probably involve our i variable, and we'd end up blowing away our approach. So that would result in an infinite loop. Um, however, so I'm going to comment that out. <coughs> however, if I compile and run this, The continue statement where it is right now in the loop has absolutely no effect whatsoever. The reason for that is that J++ is not part of the loop body. It's a very special part of this loop that always executes at the end of the current iteration regardless of what happens in the loop body. So it doesn't get called when I, if I call break. It really isn't meaningful if it gets called or not if I call break. Um, but using continue, the first thing it does is perform the uh, approach and then test the condition again. Whereas with the while loop, it just goes right back to the condition, to testing the condition. Um, and that's probably a very good example of why continue is dangerous. Um, if you, if you start dealing with complicated loops with compl complicated logic, continue can be very convenient and get you out of trying to find the right way to do things. Um, that's usually when I use it. Um, but there's, there's usually a better way to do things than using continue and break. And that's what the book says when the author says, never use continue and break. Um, <coughs> Questions on continue and break? Question? Uh-huh. 
The plus plus is the increment operator. So it it's uh, it's equivalent to that. It's just shorthand. Um, so it turns out that frequently, well, I wouldn't say frequently. Uh, sometimes we want multiple initializations, multiple uh, approaches because we're using multiple variables that have been initialized. And possibly, uh, I'm not going to say multiple conditions, but compound conditions. Multiple conditions doesn't really make sense. <coughs> Continue looping until this thing and maybe this other thing. Um, it's better formulated as a compound Boolean expression. So using ors and ands and nots and stuff like that. So you can really only have one thing, one expression in this middle piece. Uh, however, in the other two pieces, you can have more than one statement, really. Uh, so if I wanted to... Print out, uh, we want to print out 1 through 10 instead of 0 through 9. I could uh, I could do that. Uh, no, hang on. Let's complete that. There we go. Um, so the loop, the control of the loop is still exactly the same. It's 4J, 4 8J four equals 0, J less than 10, J plus plus. However, we also have this other variable that kind of trails along and is storing the actual number that we're going to print out. Uh, and we want it to start at 1 and also get incremented on every loop, every iteration of the loop, so that it goes from 1 and all the way up to 10. Uh, and notice that they're separated by commas, not semicolons. That's just to distinguish them from the separation between initialization, condition, and approach. So I'll compile and run this, and we get the numbers 1 through 10. Questions? So why do you have the The J is, so, uh, this is a slightly confounding example, but the reason that I still have the J is because I'm using the J as a control va variable. So that's basically determining the, the starting case, the ending case, and how far I am along the loop. So kind of separating control and what I'm actually printing out, which in general is actually a good idea um, to separate logic from presentation. Um, here, because they're so tightly bound, uh, k is always one greater than j. It's kind of contrived. I can easily just say print ln j plus one, uh, like we were doing with while loop. Um, but I have seen cases. They're usually few and far between, but there are cases where something like that is useful. Um, so the book does talk about the so-called for each statement. Um, which is n something that's new in Java 5. Uh, I guess that's not really all that new since we're on Java 7 now, but it's new-ish. When I started writing Java, it didn't have a, a standard way for getting keyboard input and output. Keyboard input, um, output was always there, but input wasn't. So this for each statement f still feels kind of new to me. Um, and the basic syntax is, it starts out exactly the same as a for loop. Um, and continues with uh, some some type, some identifier, identifier, um, a colon 
And then some collection looking thing. So you don't need the space in between the bare room and the full. Correct. Um I think the book does use one just for clarity. Yes. Um, this is how I usually see this written. There's a space on either side of the colon, just to specifically show, hey, there's a colon here. Um, and the thing that follows the colon is uh, something collection-like uh, that has multiple, multiple pieces to it. Uh, there are specific things in Java that are called collections, and there's this whole collection framework. Um, this syntax works on collections. Um, this syntax also works on those things that we haven't talked about yet, called arrays. I hope we talk about them soon, because they're very nice. Uh, few days, it looks like. So right now, the only thing that this is useful for that we've talked about is enumeration. Uh, and the book gives an example of this. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll use the example that the book does. Gives an enumeration suit, clubs, diamonds, hearts, and spades. And so an enum is a type. So we can say for suit. Sure, next suit. Next, next suit. Uh, and you can pronounce the colon as in. Uh, many other languages have a very similar <coughs> syntax to this. And you actually use the word in. Um, C sharp is one of those languages. I, after writing Java, I start writing this syntax in C sharp and type a colon and it yells at me. Um, so, in some collection. Um, unfortunately, uh, Java doesn't really know how to iterate over an enum, uh, but it does know how to iterate over the enum's values. Um, kind of odd, the, the soup enum has a method called values. Uh, that gives you uh, some value representation of the, the element in the enum. And uh, the, the habit uh, again, whether you have curly braces there or not doesn't really make a difference unless you have more than one statement that is supposed to be inside the body of this for. Um, I think I mentioned last time that out of out of habit, out of convention, I always do just in case I end up putting multiple statements there. That way I don't have to go back and make sure I put the curly braces there. Um, because having multiple statements that you think are executing inside a for loop that actually aren't because you forgot to put curly braces there is one of the most difficult and irritating bugs to find and fix. Simplest to fix, hardest to find. Um, so, they also use print and I'm going to use print LN. <coughs> Um, must not be local. Fine. Correct. There are lo lots of things that you can use the for each syntax with. Don't worry about why I'm typing static there. It has to be there. Uh, we'll learn about static in a couple classes.
And there we get clubs, diamonds, hearts, spades. <coughs> There's also a, I would normally say, a third type of loot. Uh, depending on your definition, it could be a variation on the first type of loot a fourth type of loop, a third type of loop. Um, in Java, it is probably the third type of loop, and the four each is the fourth type of loop, and or a variation of the four loop. Um, this type of loop is called a do-while loop. Um, it's very similar to a while loop, except that the while expression is at the end of the loop, and that's when it's tested. Um, basically, what this means is that the loop body is guaranteed to be executed once, then it evaluates the expression, and if the expression is still true, goes back to the beginning, executes the loop again, then checks the expression, and so on and so forth, until the expression is false. Um, so this is useful uh, for presenting a menu. Um, we generally don't want to ask the user for input and then give them the list of choices that they had to choose from when they gave you input. That doesn't make any sense. So, um, this is a very simple menu, and it says, uh, enter zero to quit. actually just make that a print. And we need some condition there. And this does end with a semicolon. Um, quick note on the semicolons at the end of the expression part. Uh, in a do while loop, we need a semicolon at the end of the expression part. <coughs> However, if you put a semicolon at the end of any other type of loop's expression part, that is a perfect valid, perfectly valid loop with no loop body. Um, so, especially in the case of this while loop up here, if I do that, I have an infinite loop. Believe me, that bug is really difficult to track down because it looks right. You, you, you don't even see that semicolon. Um, so be careful of that. Um, this is also a completely valid loop. Um, it is perfectly valid to have blocks inside of blocks that aren't controlled by any expression. Uh, an if statement, an else statement, uh, a for or do, uh, for or while loop. Perfectly valid. Um, we'll explain why that is later on in the semester. But uh, it basically just groups bits of code together. Uh, so there's nothing syntactically wrong <coughs> with having a semicolon there. It's just really not what you intended at all. Um, that said, at the end of a do-while construction, you do need that semicolon. It is a syntax error not to have that semicolon. Yes? In the do-while, does the while be on the same line as the closing braces or can you do So... There is nothing in Java that is any different from any other part of Java in this respect. White space doesn't mean anything. What if, some, if something requires white space, it doesn't matter what the white space is. Um, and the only cases where white space is actually required is if removing the white space would change the meaning of what is actually there. So there is nothing here that requires any white space. We just <coughs> use it for readability. Um, the reason I put the white space where I do is that I'm trying to follow Java conventions, which surprisingly I'm actually doing a pretty good job of in this class. Um, so much so that in writing C Sharp last week, I started using the Java conventions when the C Sharp conventions are totally different from Java conventions. Um, so I will try to stick to the Java conventions. So we still need some condition here. Um, and 
I'm going to uh, let's see ignore the fact that I don't quite have a keyboard yet and the reason I'm doing this here is because I don't actually I'm not saving the, the value anywhere um, so basically what that means is um, when I get an int from the keyboard if it's not equal to zero I just move again if it is equal to zero, since I say enter zero is quit, that should probably be my exit condition. Uh, and, but in order to do that, I do need <coughs> a keyboard, or something called keyboard. And it looks like I want a scanner, so let's make a scanner. Not scammer, scanner. Scanner. And in order for that to work, I do need that import statement up here and that should compile at the very least now if we run enter zero to quit um, six no eight no Negative three. Uh, no. Negative ninety-nine. Hmm. Zero. And it quits. Yeah. Um. It did quit. Um. <laughs> If you, if you look at the way that those methods are documented, it doesn't make any guarantee about looking for it. It's kind of, the name of the method is kind of ambiguous or misleading, not ambiguous. It's misleading, uh, which is worse than ambiguous. Um, it does not look for the next int. Um, it takes the next token and tries to give it to you as an int. Um, so whatever you type in, it will try as hard as it possibly can well, not really as hard as it possibly can. It tries kind of lazily um, to give you that thing back as an int. Um, if it can't interpret it as an int, it just says um, throw for input mismatch exception. I don't know what this is. This is not an int. Um, I was going to start quoting a talking head song, but I think that would be kind of odd. Um, this, is not your this is not my beautiful house. This is not my beautiful wife. Yes, once in a lifetime. Okay, so I don't remember what I was talking about. Talking again. Okay, so. <laughs> Right, right, right. So it just looks for the next token, gives it back to you as what you, the name of the method is. So if you say next double and you give it an int, that'll actually work because an int can be coerced into a double. Yes? way to figure out what's going on there is oh I know what the issue is uh, the not and then equals they have to be right next to each other because that that's one place where white space matters um, if the um, when they're separate okay. they're two different operators the not operator and the assignment operator and so Java says that doesn't make any sense so to me. So when you use the not, you can't put space on the um, So it, there is a not operator, which is 
the, the inverse operator, invert the sense of this Boolean expression, that you can have as many spaces between it, following it before the expression that you're negating. Uh, but if you're going for not equals, they do have to be right next to each other. Um, I think that's about it when it comes to loops. <coughs> Okay, so the last thing, where was it? Page 219, declaring variables within a for statement. Uh, they talk about this thing called scope. And basically what scope means is that if I try to access this variable j, or k for that matter, outside the for loop, you know, uh, system not out, uh, system not put, no, system not out dot print on J, uh, that won't work. In fact, it won't even compile. Um, cannot find simple. The reason for that is that it's something called out of scope. Um, scope is basically the lifetime of the variable, and scope is determined by those curly braces um, with some slight nuances. So the for loop is one of those nuances. Uh, it basically has its own scope that is that starts at this curly brace, ends at this curly brace, and oh by the way, it also contains this stuff. So this stuff is available inside these curly braces, but not outside of these curly braces. Uh, and that's that's basically what those curly braces do is provide a a narrower scope. Uh, so if you, uh, <coughs> likewise, declared uh, uh, L, no, that's a terrible variable name, M, um, that would also uh, have the same issue, because it's in a different scope. It's in a narrower scope. Um, However, the reverse works. Um, let's see, do I make any variables here? No. Um, if I make an int bob, uh, I can print out bob. I can print out bob because it's in a larger scope. Uh, it's, yes, variable bob might not have been initialized. Uh, let's give it a value so we know that's not preventing us from seeing any other errors. And it compiles fine. Bob, because it's in it's in the scope of the main method, is available within that scope and any narrower scopes, any scopes within that scope. Uh, however, things in narrower scopes are not available in, I guess you could call it their parent scope. Um, so things inside a for loop can't be seen outside of that for loop. This also is the case for if statements. If you have a body of an if statement and you declare variables in there, they are not accessible outside of that body. Um, this is kind of, with ifs it makes sense, because what happens if that if body doesn't execute? This is a conditional, this is a conditional execution. There's a possibility that that body might not execute. If you try to use that variable outside of the if statement, there's a possibility that it just wouldn't exist. You would not have created it. So it's easier for the compiler just to say, you can't do that. Don't even try. Um, so if you want to uh, set a, va a value to a variable within a narrower scope, you need to declare it at the widest scope that it is necessary to see that variable. Uh, so in, in our case, right now, the widest scope that we have available to us is the method. Uh, so declare it before you first need it inside the main method, 
not inside a narrower scope, and then it's visible within all the other scopes. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. Um, the, the condition part follows exactly the same um, condition rules as if statements do. Mm -hmm. yep. um, in fact, I really hope the book doesn't actually talk about this, but we can actually implement loops with if statements. Do I really want to show this? Okay, let's... Yeah, some people are shaking their heads. No, I do not really want to show this. Let's see. Let's, uh... Let's change the lines 30 and 30 through 32 to a... an if statement. So, I'm going to create something called a label. I hope they deprecated this in Java 7, so hopefully it won't work on your machines. It'll probably work on mine. Um, this is top of looping. Loop, looping stuff. Looping stuff. Um, and we'll take this. Copy it down there, and the condition will be slightly different. Uh, so in this case, it's um, no, it's still the case. If uh, if it's not equal to zero, we'll say go to loop dot loop no go to go to loop. And that should be a semicolon. Um, it looks like it looks like they took this out of Java, which is a good thing. You should never use go to ever in any language. They're bad. Um, <coughs> so this was valid in previous versions of Java. This is valid in C. Uh, actually, unfortunately, this is valid in most languages. Um, but basically, this does exactly the same. If it were to compile, this would do exactly the same as uh, this do while. So basically, this is a label that says, uh, gives this line of code a name. Uh, it doesn't change the execution, it actually doesn't get executed. This is not an, a runtime thing. This is a compile time thing. So the first statement that it gets executed is line 35, which is exactly like line 31. And execution is no different. Um, then we test our condition, and if the condition is still true, then go to basically says, go somewhere else. Go to. Go to this label called loop. Um, this is exactly the same as the label. So this is a name, a label is a named position in code. Uh, goes back and does it again. And as soon as um, keyboard.nextint does not equal zero, uh, as soon as keyboard.nextint equals zero, is equal to zero, this um, if statement body does not get executed, so the next statement would get executed. Of course, this does not compile, so you have absolutely no reason to use this. As, uh, in addition to the fact that programming like this is bad. Very, very, very bad. So, we'll make that disappear. Uh, Why is it to uh, initialize the enumeration outside of the main bracket? That 
uh, I forget the error that it gave me, but, oh, yes, I, I remember the error that it gave me. The error that it gave me is that enums can't be local. So that's true for all enumerations? That is true for all enumerations. And that's, um, this, the term local is a description of the scope. So local refers to um, usually <coughs> methods. Um, local variables are things that are declared and used within a single method. Uh, this is actually uh, referred to as class level. Uh, and the main reason that I had to put a static in front of the enum is because the main method has static in front of it. Um, so methods that have a static in front of them can only access the other things that are static. Um, and things that are passed in as arguments. So if you didn't have static in front of the enum, it would correct. It would it would be a compiler error and it would say uh, I'm not actually using it, am I? No, I am. Uh, hang on. Huh. It might, um, that might be an optimization that Java does now that didn't used to be the case. Um, I imagine it probably does that because when we learn about what static actually means, it'll be clear that having a non-static enum doesn't make any sense at all. So it might just automatically say, this enum has to be static. I like to be explicit about things. Um, just it, it makes for more readable code. It also makes for more consistent code. You can easily, if everything that is static has static in front of it, it's easy to see, oh, all of this is static. Um, so that all the stuff under the public is static, too. Right, so basically, um, this, is, this starts a block that is the entire main method. Um, and this is, you can consider it kind of like the block header. I don't know if there's actually an official name for that, um, but I kind of generalize um, the, the if condition part of an if statement, the for all that nonsense part of a for statement, um, while condition, all that part of a, a while statement. I consider those, those pieces to be block headers. They kind of define what this block is, they give the block meaning, um, but they don't actually describe what is inside the block. Well, you don't have to put static in the uh, Right, Sorry, no. Because you have it from right. the main header. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is there anything else in the chapter that I didn't mention that anyone has questions on? I know I didn't go in the same order that the chapter did. I like my order better. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, listing 4.6 is a way to avoid using um, break or continue or that sorts of things. Um, so, actually, at, at that, at that, with this particular loop, um, if you replace that R more equals false with a break statement, it, the loop, the behavior of the loop would be identical. Um, however, um, especially if you have, uh, say, a menu and then some exit condition, and then uh, some 
rest of the loop. That happens on every option except for the exit condition. Um, one way to get out of that loop before you start doing computations or calculations under the assumption that you're not in the exit condition, um, one way to do that is to use break. Break out of the loop immediately. Um, the book definitely considers that bad programming. In general, that's considered bad programming. In Java, it's definitely considered bad programming. Um, so using some Boolean sentinel variable that you, you can call uh, looping or is looping or should continue to loop or uh, here it's are more. Um, you can use that if <coughs> the user enters your exit condition, set that variable to false uh, and then only do the rest of the loop if, if that variable is true and also use that as your loop condition. So it'll basically, in effect, skip over the rest of the loop, check the condition, the condition will fail, and you're done. Right, so the, in general, the way to do that is to, as your initialization step, the Boolean variable should start out as true. So that you can basically say, what, it, it reads like English, while, I should continue looping, um, as opposed to while not, I should stop looping. That's the 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 phrasing is a little weirder and uh, lots more room for bugs. Um, so basically, if that variable is true, you want the loop to continue looping. As soon as you set it to false, that should say I, I'm done. Nothing. Don't do anything else. Don't loop anymore. It's basically Yes, except for the fact that it does it doesn't break immediately. You can still um, you can we haven't gotten to using files or anything like that, but you can close files nicely. You can do all sorts of other stuff. Basically, clean up after an iteration of the loop, and then nicely exit the loop. Do you have to use a sentinel number on the on the variable? Hmm. So the condition under which you set the Boolean variable um, is application dependent. It really depends what you're using it for. So in this case, it's looking for a zero, and if you type in a zero, it'll quit. If you're looking for, uh, if someone types exit, and that's your quit condition, then your condition, your um, your comparison is: is the string that the user typed in equal to exit? Um, another option is, is is my program state something that means I should exit? Uh, so a sentinel integer is a common way of dealing with stuff like that. Um, for now, it's probably the easiest way to construct a menu uh, because next scanner.nextint is very convenient. Uh, using any Anything more complicated involves string processing, and we haven't gotten there yet. Um, previous versions of this class never got to there, which is kind of makes me scratch my head because string string processing is very important. Most of the way that we can communicate with computers is through strings. Uh, leaving that out is kind of feels like there's something missing. Uh, so we'll talk about string processing as we get closer to the end of the semester. Oh, it's a it's a, it's a signal to end it. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. You want your sentinel value, I won't say sentinel number, but whatever your sentinel value is, should be something that doesn't have meaning within the context of the rest of your program and is unique to this is what you type in to terminate. Oh, so if, you, if they want the prompters to type a number, you can type in a letter and that would be set value. Sure. Um, there's a little more computation involved in that right now, uh, but that, that is an instance. Uh, it wouldn't make sense, for instance, to, if you're computing some statistics on positive numbers, to say that three is your sentinel value. Because three is a valid number. Um, 
when you're de when when we get to dealing with files, um, the Sentinel value for the end of the file is actually the control D character. Uh, so basically, it, it's a, a non-printing character that has no no meaning whatsoever except that it means end of file. Uh, kind of a real world example of that. Any other questions about loops? Uh, I still have not graded your homework, uh, programming assignment one. I am going to do that tonight. Um, I really have no excuse. They're printed out, ready to grade. I will grade them tonight. I will hand them back to you on Wednesday. I will post your grades tonight when I finish grading them. Um, handing them back to you is also my way of helping me figure out what all your names are. I know some of them. I don't know most of them. Um, so hopefully by the end of the summer I'll know all your names. Um, there is also, let's see, Programming assignment two is due tonight at 11.59. I think it has something to do with computing the radius of circles and spheres, um, or various statistics on circles and spheres. Uh, uses if statements and loops. Um, so we've talked about everything that's necessary to do. No, hang on, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yes, I'm getting way ahead of myself. Programming assignment two has absolutely nothing to do with it. It's circumference and radius. It's circumference and radius. Circumference, area, volume. Of, uh, yeah. Given a, given a radius, computes some numbers. Um, so that just has to do with variables and, and expressions. Stuff we talked about last week. Print was in that one. that one. Yes. So a bunch of stuff we talked about last week. The one that's out today, technically out today, due a week from today, that one does involve if statements and loops. And do you have it up on your screen? It's something to do with uh, subtract. Okay, so you get choices between add, subtract, multiply, and divide, and, and quit. Uh, and then type in two numbers, and it computes the sum, difference, multiplication, division, that sort of thing. Uh, so a couple of statements involved. Um, you could probably do it as a switch, um, and at least one loop involved. I think there's probably only one loop involved. I think I, yes, number two, write a do while loop. So use a do while loop. Um, programming assignment two should be graded much quicker than programming assignment one was. Um, it's just a matter of when I print it out. So. That'll probably happen tomorrow. Um, the, the grading infrastructure has all been set up now, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, there's something else I was going to say. I don't know. I think that's it. If I think of it, I'll make an announcement. And next time we'll talk about whatever's next. Um, looks like chapter five. Divide, did I divide that up into... <laughs> I don't intend to be funny. It just kind of happens. Okay. Okay. I've been uh, I've been watching a lot of Eddie Izzard lately, so it might kind of I, I'm nowhere near as funny as he is, but it might kind of the what? Oh, okay. I like his stand up. I and his, he's funny, but I, and he he brings it to the the roles that he plays in other movies. But his stand up is just ridiculously hilarious. Um, what am I looking for? Uh, yeah, sure. Classes, methods, top-down design. Looks like I'm skipping a section. So, 
five one and five three. And then the next day I'll talk about five two. So the decision on the midterm was that I was posting it on July second and it would be due on July 9th, I think. Posting it on this website, yes. So is that open book, open note? It is, it's, it's take home. It's whatever you want. It's a lot easier to... I, I can't make this sound good, but it's a lot easier to assume you're not trustworthy. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it, I, I mean, I know some professors do that. They say, it's the honor system, here's a take-home exam, only use your book, don't use your notes. And I guess it works out, um, but I, I'd rather not try to go through the trouble of trying to figure out, did this person use their notes or just their book? So, it's take-home, use whatever is available to you. Um, just because it's take home doesn't mean it will be impossible. It might mean that I'm looking for more correct answers than if you only had two and a half hours to do it. Um, but it'll be, it'll certainly be more of an emphasis on applications than an in class test would be. Because hopefully, the things that you could memorize and regurgitate, you could also look up in your book. So that wouldn't really, that would be a test of whether you had your book, and how well you could use the index. That's really not what I want to test. The, what I want to test is, do you understand the material? Can you put it into use? Um, you know, do you know what's going on? Uh, so I'm not, out to, I'm not out to fail anyone. I really don't like failing people. Um, but I'm also, having all A's doesn't look great either. The university looks at that and is like, hmm, is this guy too easy? So hopefully we'll have a decent distribution of grades. Um, it'll be just like the, I think I, let's see, I think I said it, yes, do 11.59 p.m. on Monday, July 9th. So email it to me. Um, I don't care what the subject line is as long as it has the, the important part in it. CS 1150.1206. So it gets sorted to the right general area of my email. Um, there's no, I don't have a specific folder set up for midterm exam. So as long as it gets to the CS 1150 area of my email, I'll see it, I'll grade it, you'll get a hopefully good grade. Um, if you want the confirmation that I got it, um, I know I already failed at one, Jill, but. If you want a confirmation that I got it, make a note in the email, hey, can you send me a note that you got my exam? Um, I would be more than happy to do so. Um, and I'll actually be on the lookout for that sort of comment. So, um, Right, which I guess means I have to write an exam this weekend. <laughs> I actually have to write two exams this weekend because the other class has their exam next week as well. Hmm? The fourth is only one day. It is. But so. In November, some people. Um, actually, last year I saw pictures of stores that had posted signs in their windows saying it is as long as it is as long as it is november we are not decorating with christmas decorations one holiday at a time um so july 4th the way i expect it'll happen is you'll wake up late on july 4th you'll at well we, we have to go in order at and uh you know 2 p.m. You'll, you'll go somewhere and start celebrating, which maybe might involve some festivities. And, you know, at midnight, 2 a.m., something like that, then you'll go home or just crash wherever you are and then wake up at about 2 p.m. the next morning, afternoon, and then you'll be fresh and hungover and ready to finish the exam. 
Um, so uh, a day and a half in there, it's a take-home exam. Plan around your day and a half of not working on the exam. I don't expect you to work on the exam July 4th or the day after. It's supposed to be a holiday. Have fun. <laughs>